Good morning. It's another Saturday in the times of coronavirus. In the times of what uh, some people are calling the new normal, but Dr. Yi hates that. Because for us, we've always been in business, the clinic's been open, there's no new normal. Uh, and also, we have a deep understanding of the biology of viruses. Viruses and bacteria lives in the collective ecosystem that we live in. And there's something called our collective microbiome. In the microbiome, around us as individuals are billions of bacteria and viruses. And so just because one pops up that is different, causes havoc, does not mean everything comes to an end. It means that we go back to our basic roots, the architecture that God gave us, and within that architecture, we have an offensive and defensive strategy for dealing with bacteria and viruses. And so, um, as we continue our discussions about how you survive, you know, some of us are going to write books, movies, music, how I survived the times of coronavirus. Today, we continue our discussion on cardiometabolic health. Cardiometabolic health is the number one killer for Americans. It's a very important area, and many people do not understand what cardiometabolic health means. Last week, we began by exploring the context of cardiometabolic risk and the issues around cardiometabolic, issues like inflammation, issues like oxidative stress, issues like diabetes, it, uh, a lot of the chronic illnesses that support or enable uh, and increases your cardiometabolic risk. But at the core of overall chronic illness indicators are when your triglycerides begin to get out of balance. That is the first important indication that something is wrong with your health. And so we're going to talk about that today. By the way, my name is Charles Sine. I'm the CEO of Anti-Fragility Health. So welcome to our Saturday workshop series. And so we're going to start talking about, uh, for those who are joining us live from Vietnam, from the East Coast, from heaven, and from hell, you know, even if you're in hell, you could do with a good heart. <laughs> that might help you get back into heaven. So welcome to all of you and um, we're going to have an amazing conversation this morning. So but first of all, um, there are three things that we do in the clinic, three important things. We do diagnosis, diag, Gnosis, my God, I can't spell anymore. Then we evaluate the results and then we recommend intervention or what we call treatment pathways. So number one, and this continues in increasing cycles until you achieve a level of maturity where you are fully competent. And what do I call competence? So let me teach my audience because my staff know this already, is know, do, and habits. And when you go through this a lot of times, you become competent about your health. Very important, guys, that we start here at this premise. The objective of these workshops is to build your competence about your health. So you don't outsource it to your doctor, and as most of our patients will walk in and hear and say, my doctor said, your doctor doesn't own your health. You own your health, and the doctor is just a support person to help you in that journey to health. The journey to health is your journey, and you need to own it. And how do you own it? You become competent in it. So you know about your health. You do the things that are going to keep you healthy and build the habits that are going to sustain the actions, right? So today we're going to talk about cardiometabolic diagnostics. 
But before we get into cardiometabolic diagnostics, let's talk about some big definitions. The biggest issue in heart disease is cholesterol. My beautiful friend, cholesterol. Such a beautiful guy. But people think he's a bad boy. Cholesterol is critical for life. It does an amazing thing. When the sun hits our body, it uses cholesterol to make what? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. As you know, without vitamin D, you'll die. Vitamin D, really, really critical. It also helps in producing bile. What is bile? Bile is the, uh, uh, driven from the liver and passes through the kidney where it's filtered to break down a lot of complex proteins and, and fats. And it does a lot of other things. But cholesterol is so critical to our life and therefore the whole transfer and excretion of cholesterol drives the architecture of most of cardiometabolic health. And what are the two things that do that? Number one is LDL and number two is HDL. What's LDL? Low density lipoprotein. A lipid and a protein living together. A lipoprotein. A lipid, what's a lipid? Fat and protein living together. It's a lipoprotein. Low density. It means they're little boys, like African little boys, right? They're little boys, low density. They're not thick. Then we have the high-density lipoproteins. And so why are these two really critical and important? They are mandatory for the transportation and retransportation and excretion of cholesterol, right? Cholesterol is critical, but we all know that when cholesterol is too much, it causes problems which we're going to talk about and that's the key issue around diagnosis. But let's just go back to LDL and so LDL is what carries cholesterol into the tissue and into organs. And when it gets stuck in there and the amount is too much, when we measure that, you have high LDL and LDL is bad cholesterol, you know we gave it that name. LDL is not a bad cholesterol, it's just that when it accumulates, it's bad. What does HDL do? HDL is the one that comes and carries out the excess cholesterol, takes it back to the liver where it came from, and reroutes it where it is then cleaned up in the kidneys and brings it back to the liver for distribution back into the body or for the ones that, right, there are two sources of cholesterol from our diet and from the ones that are manufactured. Are we getting this? Now you're building some big competence around these three known things that scare everybody, right? So there's been significantly new development around conversations around these numbers. Is LDL up good or LDL down bad? Is HDL up good or L HDL bad down? Is cholesterol up good or cholesterol bad down? And has caused a lot of confusion. There's new research that shows that it's complicated, like most of our relationships. It's complicated. So let's begin and with some education around one of the most advanced diagnostic tools that we use, and this is called Boston Heart Diagnostics, it's one of our partners, and we use their reporting, and so some of the foundations have laid out about cholesterol, around HDL, around LDL, and the transport mechanisms of how we measure to understand underlying risk, and what is really the risk underlying cardiometabolic issues. It is the risk of accumulation of cholesterol in the vessels. 
So we have ultrasound measurements here that we use to measure the carotid artery, which is one of the closest arteries to the surface of the skin. And as I trained you last time, arteries are always deep inside the skin. God was really smart. Because if arteries are close to the surface, you get injured, you'll die very quickly. So he buried them deep. And there are very few places in the body where arteries are close to the surface. And that's some of the biggest ones from the heart the carotid artery, where it splits, coming from the heart, it then splits into two, one going up. That's why I have a high-performing brain, because that artery going to my brain is really juicy red blood with oxygen. And then the other one, I think, goes down somewhere. Um, Pauline, that's gonna to go to medical school, I'm sure knows that better than I do, where it goes. But I know it goes somewhere to perform. Right, so we do the ultrasound and we can see the thickness and the flexibility of the artery. So what happens when you age, you lose what we call the stenosis, the strengthening of the arteries. So it doesn't have the ability for that, for flexing. And secondly, there's accumulation of cholesterol inside the arteries and why is that accumulation the intention is to repair the injury to what we call the intima which is that surface the inner surface of the arterial wall and that's why that accumulation begins and then causes narrowing and if that accumulation of cholesterol is strong like cement then you actually have less risk if it is soft then there's a risk for it to break and cause clotting, which then leads to what we call cardiovascular events like stroke. Making sense? So cholesterol sits within this architecture, and most women is their biggest risk in life. Menopausal women have three times cardiovascular risk compared to men. And we know it has to do with hormones and other things, uh, but that's why we really want to focus and make sure that menopausal women really understand this particular subject. So let's walk through this report, and then we'll come back and begin to talk again about some of the measurement issues around this so that you understand. So when you go to your doctor, most of you get labs, and most people do lousy labs. Most patients who walk in here with their labs are not measuring the right things. We're going to talk about it because, for example, we're going to measure the different kinds of LDL. Then we're going to measure the different kinds of HDL, right? Their particle, their functionality, and their performance. And if you don't do what we call a deep, specialized analysis, of your triglycerides and your lipid, what we call the lipid panel, then you do not understand your risk. And therefore, the interventions, the recommendations or interventions to address your underlying issues are then challenged. All of us come with genetic underlying cardiometabolic risks and susceptibilities that we inherited. That's why no two cardiometabolic patients are the same, right? For example, I have given my daughter some risks, right? And therefore, she needs to understand what those risks are, and we'll talk about some of those genetic markers and those genetic uh, issues. But, so let's then go back. So, uh, Boston Heart Diagnostic addresses four things about your heart health. Number one, lipids, right? And I've started by talking about lipids. Why are lipids important? If you have the concentrate in the wrong places and cause blockage, you get a stroke, and you're paralyzed. And you know the paralysis, what causes the paralysis? It is the lack of oxygen for a few moments to that part of the brain. That's what causes the paralysis. It's not the stroke itself, it is the blockage and the lack of oxygenation. Whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, two hours, 
determines the intensity of that stroke, particular kind of stroke. We're not going to go deep into that, but you need to appreciate that the blockage, and what causes the blockage? Accumulation of cholesterol, and if it is not good plaque, you know, we call that accumulation plaque. If it is not cemented plaque, then it could break. And that piece that breaks could call an embolism anywhere else in the body. It causes a blockage. And once part of our body is blocked from receiving pure, good oxygenated blood, it dies. It begins to die. And that is what we call paralysis. And so people who have already microcirculation problems can feel tingling, numbness, pain. Those are all signs that that part of the body is not receiving enough blood supply. That is oxygenated blood supply. Very, very important. Okay, let's walk through this. So lipids, very, very important first part of your heart problem. The second thing is inflammation. Why is inflammation important? Because when there's inflammation in the arteries, it causes higher accumulation of cholesterol. So we have measures to measure how much inflammation and oxidative stress you have. I'm not going to explain inflammation and oxidative stress today because it would take me way out and if you want to know you can watch my earlier videos on that to understand what is inflammation and what's oxidative stress. As you know those two things, those two bad boys are at the source of a lot of chronic illness. Then we also look at your metabolics. Why? Because the amount of sugar in your blood causes stress and inflammation and causes the accumulation of cholesterol because when there's a lot of sugar in the blood, it injures the intima, which is the inner lining of the artery. And it is the response to that injury that causes the accumulation of cholesterol. And then finally, we'll look at your genetics. So let's walk through. This is a sample report uh, from uh, Diagnostics. It's very important. Uh, so let's look at the four big things that it talks about. So what this report does is that it is trying to measure your risk for heart disease. And so it's going to show you things that are green, that means it's good. Things that are yellow, that means that you should begin to slow down, just like the traffic lights. When it's red, it means that you should stop. It doesn't mean that you should continue like my daughter, drive past. Maybe I, if I speed through, I get through the light, yep. right? So when it says red, it means you should stop. It doesn't mean, I mean, that's why they don't write it in French. It's a red light. Nobody needs to explain to you that that means stop. You cannot tell the police that, Mais j'ai parlé, j'ai cru que c'était, uh, il faut partir. <laughs> and they will say, what is that? The light is red. <laughs> okay, so let's look at it. You look at lipids, lipids. It's about HDL, the boy carrying the cholesterol back to the liver, and the LDL are the ones that take the cholesterol to the tissue the HDL transports them back, and you see the blockage and the accumulation beginning. All of that, the study of those things, is what called, we call lipidology, the study of lipids. It is critical, number one issue in health. You have to understand it. And if your doctor is not measuring that in detail, as we're going to see later on, then you need to come visit us. Number two, we are looking at inflammation. You see, inflammation is the beginning of that blockage. And where does that, what is inflammation? Inflammation is triggered by a wounding, by injury. Where does the injury come from? Sugar in the blood. That is, right? Playing in the arteries causes damage, right? And so the body responds by inflammation to go fix the injury. And then what is available are the fats, cholesterol, to help seal that until the repair is done. 
and if it's not done properly then it accumulates right very important that we look at the inflammation matters they are connected to the whole issue of plaque formation and atherosclerosis now let's look at your metabolics sugar in the blood you see that and then the sugar scratches the walls as it's running around you know those of us who like sugar that's what it does it scratches the walls and then the body has to respond to that inflammation so it can heal it right that's why we need to look at your sugar and we're going to talk about that then your genetics but you know since that i am from the source of life you know those original forests in africa because I have the core Adamic gene. I have given my daughter very good genes. So except she messes up, she could live forever because she has pure genes. So we want to look at your genetics and really understand what's going on, right? So now let's begin the big, big journey of talking about this stuff. So people say bad cholesterol. There is no bad cholesterol. It's just excess cholesterol, right? So the name bad cholesterol is really not fair to a good boy that does good things, but because of our lifestyle, it accumulates, right? So cholesterol is essential and it only becomes bad when there's too much and it's too small and it's sticky. And we're gonna look at some of the measurements around that. So you can see from the picture why? Why is there blockage? The cholesterol was on its journey quietly to the tissues. Then it found inflammation. It says, hey, we need to deposit some fat here for repair. And, that, and then it gets trapped in the blockage. And then the blockage begins to block and your high blood pressure begins to rise because the blood is trying to force its way through. Right? Making sense? Now let's look at some of the data that we are supposed to understand. So they tell you, if you look at this report, very few people except Boston, there are very few providers that provide this detail around your lipids. It's very, very important. So they say, Jane, you are in danger because you have a high risk of forming a blockage which can lead to a heart attack or stroke. Okay? Some people will see this and say, well, but I have three yellows. I should be fine. And I only have four reds, right? You think that we're in high school where there's a scoring here. After all, I got a C, right? What is wrong, Dad? Cs are good. And I said, no. For a black woman, a C is bad for your health. You need an A, right? So let's look at why you should have green, right? Look at total cholesterol should be green because if you have more than you should that's wrong and how does the body control how much you should have we eat and the liver produces when there's excess the the kidney excretes the excess cholesterol so your cholesterol balance is a very very important indication of health then we have ldlc cholesterol which is normally the accumulated ones that we don't want to have. If you have more than what you should have, it then shows you there. Then we want to look at triglycerides. What are triglycerides? There are the original fats or lipids, right? And they come in different forms. We have short chain, medium chain, and long chain triglycerides. These are all different kinds of fats that the body needs for the, the, the process of manufacturing and supporting our architecture. And the group of them are called triglycerides. But don't forget, we are measuring how, many, how much of them are in the bloodstream. They are not supposed to be too much in the bloodstream. Why? Because they should have gotten to their destination. When there's too much in the bloodstream, there's something wrong with regard to our absorption and our ability to use the triglycerides properly so it accumulates in the bloodstream, right? Then the APBO is 
um, uh, 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 a specific mutation, a gene mutation of the LDL, and then we also measure a couple of these things. So let me walk into a more detailed, yeah, okay, that was just the summary. Can I have the more detailed one? This is a summary one. It doesn't give me all the details. So now let's walk through some of my notes on this. Um, sorry guys, let me take a drink of water. So do you get me a more completed sample of uh, Boston, the bigger report? This is the small one. Okay, so LDL we talked about, it's garbage, it's the garbage and that you know for lipids, all the facts that are required, and then HDL is the collector, is the one, so the lipids are deep inside the cells and the tissues, and the LDL one is the big transport guys, the truck. You know how at home, the LDL will be your trash container inside the house, where you put the trash in the garage, then the HDL is the truck that comes to pick each of the containers. Is this making sense? So that's why we give you only two LDLs at home. One for sustainability, and the second one for composting, right? All the trash and the green trash. We give you just two containers, you know, for Karen and Luke, they might need four, right? Because they produce so much trash. Yeah, so every Tuesday, we have to push those LDL trolleys out. When we forget, what happens when we forget to push the LDL trolleys out? We have to wait until another week, and now we have bad cholesterol at home. See what happens? And then during coronavirus time, what if the truck doesn't come? Ah, the whole neighborhood has a bigger accumulation of cholesterol. So it is really about collecting cholesterol and taking it for excretion and for reprocessing, right? It's very, very important. So one of the big things that um, we, we look at is that, uh, did we find a detailed report? We should have samples in the file somewhere, or oh, the one online, printed from online. The more detailed sample report. Oh, okay, thank you. It was here, yeah, thanks. Yeah, give me all of that. Oh, okay. Right, so yeah, I, I need this so that I can really walk you through the details of this report. So it's another sample report, it just has the fuller details that the other one doesn't have. So let me go and show you where I was. Okay, so, all right. So if you remember, we were on this page where we were looking, I know this is challenging, but if you don't know about your health, it's your heart, you're gonna die. No, the doctor is not responsible for you dying. You are responsible for your heart. I know some of you think, well, but my doctor said, yeah, well, the day you die, your doctor is gonna come and say, uh, sorry, I made a mistake and sign you a check. Unfortunately, we don't riot when doctors make mistakes. We only riot when police people make mistakes. It's kind of stupid, isn't it? Because doctors make mistakes when people die. Okay, let's look at these numbers, right? So we're talking about the different kinds of cholesterol. Sorry. Yeah, we, we spoke about all of that. So now let's go to the second page. Now we can look at HDL cholesterol, which is the good one, because here we were just talking about the bad boys, the bad cholesterol. I didn't say they were bad. It's just that when you have too much of them, it's not good. These are the ones where if you have too much of them, they're good, right? HDL cholesterol. Why having a lot of HDL is good? Because the more trucks we have carrying the trash, it's a good thing that we can do trash carrying more often. Do you get that? So think about LDL and HDL as your trash. 
If you have more LDL at home, there's no space in your garage. But if we had more HDL trucks carrying our trash, then we can have more pickup trash days. Then people like uh, Pauline will not have to accumulate so much trash. Then they can push the trolley out, right? Then they say, Mama, can you come and pull the trolley? It's too heavy. You understand? So HDL, LDL is very important and it's all about transportation of fat, of cholesterol. And the things that gives those lipids the lipoproteins legs, don't forget it's a lipoprotein. Low density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein. What gives them this lipid protein combination legs to move? It's the protein part of it that attaches to the lipid and you can see the little guys moving and carrying the cholesterol. That's their job, to carry it to the tissue and to carry it out of the tissue in the bloodstream to the liver, from the liver it's pushed into the kidney for excretion, and then the kidney pushes it back to the liver for distribution, right? You need to know that. Your liver and your kidney, the guys are really working hard all the time. Look at the four critical organs of life, your lungs, your heart, your liver, and your kidney. Critical. They're working all the time to take care of your lousy self who's not paying attention to your health. Paying attention to your health is going to help those four organs optimize. I didn't talk about your brain, right? Your brain is one of them. But those four organs down here, lung, heart, liver, and kidney, critical in this whole cardiometabolic architecture, right? Why is the lungs critical? They bring oxygen into the blood. If not, why do we have a blood system? It's to distribute oxygen. And what does oxygen do? It's a critical component for ATP, for the production of energy that powers everything, right? So we need to understand how these organs all tie together. And God was really smart because he called me as his software engineer to help with the design, right? That's why we can talk about it so well. Then let's look at the APOA. It's the strength of the, and these things sit on top of the uh, HDL and, and powers. It's like a turbo. It powers, it gives to carry out the bad cholesterol. So sometimes it arrives and the cholesterol is too heavy and it needs extra power to load it and drive off to where it needs to go. So we measure all those things. The more of them you have, the more it's easy now for your trucks to carry, right? It's like having a Maserati and put 87 gas in. You know, that's what my daughter thinks. That when they say put 91 gas, they think they're not smart. So she will drive her car and put 87 so she can save money, right? So when they say put 91 gas, they're saying that that gas is optimized for that car engine, right? Then, the Boston Heart has a special thing that we call an HDL map. This is something that most of you, when you run your labs, will not have seen. An HDL map, we found out, shows up that there are four, sorry, there are five particle types for HDL, right? In some neighborhoods, we have small trucks. In some neighborhoods, Industrial, we have big trucks. In some very big companies, we have very big trucks. And in some, we have large trucks. That's what this HDL particle size tells us. What kind of trucks do you have, right? And you, we want to make sure that you have enough of the all kind of trucks because as you get older, sometimes the cholesterol is going to be big Sometimes it's going to be medium, sometimes it's going to be very little, so you need to deploy the appropriate truck for the evacuation of cholesterol. So we have alpha-1 very large HDL particles. If you don't have enough, that's not a good sign. You need to have enough of those. Alpha-2, we had very large, now we have large, right? 
The very large is where we have two trucks locked together. Very large, very big truck. Then we have medium, like pulling size truck. Then we have small, like look size truck or nada truck. Then we have pre beta truck, that's a truck like Jacqueline. Little trucks that are going to collect the little dirt. Especially those people living in apartment buildings who don't have big containers like us who have big garages, right? <laughs> they have their little trucks carrying their trash to the main place for the big truck to come and carry. You see, the, the size of the HDO particles is very critical. That you have, there are five of them, and you need to have all of them in the green space, which means lots of carriers in the parking lot, right? So when we measure, this HDL map is a more powerful indicator of your cardiometabolic health, that you have the right trucks required for carrying cholesterol, right? I, I'm making sense. I'm spending a lot of time on this because you need to have a deep understanding of the biology or biochemistry of LDL and HDL. Cholesterol is not bad. It is very important, but then again, I'm going to caution, right, which is emerging new research that tells us that if you have too much, and it, it gives us a, a risk model, and I'll show you the graph of that risk model, that shows that, okay, sorry, we're in deep math territory now, that shows that hazard ratio is risk, that even when you have too much HDL, it's not good. It blocks the pathway. Then there's traffic jam of the trucks. So God has made it that HDL optimization, the number of trucks need to be around a certain number. We used to presume that having very many HDL is good, but think about it. Like in my enclave my clothes if there are two trucks they cannot get out because it's a one-way road right so you need just one truck coming in and getting out before another truck so if two trucks arrive they'll be like can you clear the road before the other one so having too many trucks carrying cholesterol is also not a good thing so this is just very very new research so you look at the hdlc that's a good hdl it is improving, and then the performance starts, right, decreasing. So it's very important that you um, manage your HDL risk appropriately, okay? So let's continue looking at our data. So I, as I said, from the Boston Heart HDL map, we have five types of particles, it's very important this particle size, especially for menopausal women, it's a significant indicator of cardiovascular risk. And so we spend a lot of time on this. And so based on this, you're beginning to develop an understanding which we're gonna explore because not, right now we're just talking about diagnosis. We take all this data and do evaluation and we're not there yet, we're just talking about diagnosis. So you need to understand the data we're diagnosing. Now, let's look at what we call cholesterol balance. How much of it you should be having, right? So, we know that cholesterol is produced from two places. Number one, from the food we eat, or the omegas, three omega, well, in most Americans eat mostly omega-6 which is really the problem. If you eat too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3, you get sick. So there's a balance that is required for omega-3s. And omega-3s are very special oils. They come from very few places, very few, like anchovies, sardines. Very few fishes have good omega-3. Very few places produce good omega-3. The one you're buying from Costco, 
I cannot guarantee. <laughs> if you can smell it, it's rancid. What's rancid? It is fats going bad. You should not be able to smell fat. If you smell it, it's bad. Okay? Fish oil you should pop in your mouth as I did with my daughter on video last week and eat it and there is no fishiness. You cannot smell it. If you can smell it, it's gone rancid. It's bad fish oil. There are two sources of fish oil. There are two sources of omega-3 outside of the body. Number one, there are very few plants that produce omega-3s. And specifically, uh, I was looking at uh, a, a, a video in Israel last night. There's this plant, I think it's called Jolopa or whatever. It produces very good omega-3 and also flaxseed. Flaxseeds or flaxseed oil, omega-3, as you know, is critical treatment for cancer patients. So, and it's a vegetarian option for people who have fish allergies. So that's your option. So let's go back and talk. And the second way in which cholesterol is produced is in the liver. So let's look at it. So we measure that. So Boston Heart has a cholesterol balance, what we call production markers. So latosterol is produced by the liver. That is the cholesterol that the liver produces. And demestrol also is produced by the liver. So you want to look at the two things that the liver produces that are cholesterol, uh, what we call cholesterol initiators. These are very critical measures. And when you have too much of it, it is a problem. You just have to have the right balance for it. Then let's look at the absorption. So there's production, right? And what is the production? The production is then taken to the tissues, right? And then the absorption, it's when it's coming back from the tissues, they have to absorb it for circulation back to the kidney for excretion. Let's look at, so beta cytosterol is absorbed from food and a campesterol is absorbed from food. So absorption from food are important markers for your cholesterol balance, right? So think about it. There's returning cholesterol from the tissues to the liver, and then there's the one that's absorbed from food then makes your full composite amount of cholesterol. And they have to be in balance. So if you absorb too much, and the body produces too much, then we have over uh, cholesterol again, right? But because, as we grow older, our liver is not as efficient anymore. For older people, we need to take more omega-3s so that we can support the body, right? Rather than having less. So let's move to the next section. Now I want to talk about inflammation, right? I said I was going to talk about four things. I know some of you fell asleep already, but let me remind you about the four things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the measurement of lipids. And what are lipids? It's a beautiful name for fats. Mm -hmm. Lipids. I love it. And they call that whole area that I've been talking about the lipid panel lipidology. The understanding of how fats flow in the body. Right? Cholesterol, LDL, HDL, particle sizes, transport, blah, 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 absorption, markers, production, all of that is about lipids, right? Very complicated, but you have to understand it. If not, you would die stupid. And death doesn't forgive stupid people. Death is not going to come and say, look, oh, I can see you're stupid. You didn't know. I'll forgive you. Dead says you're stupid, so let's get rid of your gene from the pool, from the gene pool, right? That's the point, because the people who live long and take care of their health, the universe wants more of those people. So let's look at the inflammation markers. There are four inflammation markers that we are looking at in this panel, and they're very, very important. And again, what causes inflammation, right? Inflammation is caused by wounding. Inflammation is the body's response to injury. 
So we have acute inflammation, which is good, chronic inflammation, which is bad. So when you keep eating sugar again and again, it is injuring your arteries and causing inflammation, which the body has to fix. You get the point? That's the challenge about eating too much carbohydrates and having too much sugar in your blood. It's not like, oh, I'm different. No, we're all the same. You're not supposed to be eating sugar and get over it. Oh, I, I love sugar. Yeah, yeah, get over it. I love sugar too. I don't eat it because of this. Those sugar things, they're going to... I showed you before, right? Let me go back and show you those bad boys called sugar and what they are doing in your arteries. We saw that picture, right? The sugar, the causing injury to the intima. Intima is that inner lining of the artery, and that's what leads to inflammation. Now, let's look at the inflammation markers. There are four of them, and we, when we run your blood and we see these inflammation markers, it's telling us that you have inflammation, right? If not, how else are we going to do? And it's not like Luke wakes up one morning, uh, uh, Darling, Karen, I feel inflamed. <laughs> you said it before. I feel inflamed with love. <laughs> right? These inflammation markers, you don't feel them. They're in your blood. And that's the only way you're going to know. That's why this clinic, we practice prevention. If every year you're not running this detailed blood analysis, then you don't know that you're dying slowly already. Until you go to the doctor one day and they say, oh, you have arthritis. Then you're like, doctor, how long is it going to take for me to heal it? Well, if you change your lifestyle about five years, because it took 20, 30 years for you to develop this shit. That's why it's very important you look at these measures and you understand it. And there's no forgiveness for being ignorant. I keep repeating that. The universe doesn't care about ignorance. Knowledge is the key for you to survive. If you're ignorant, that's your problem. That's why we run these workshops for free. If not, I should be charging what? 500 bucks per workshop. Whoa. <laughs> that's what I was charging in consulting per hour. Should be charging, right? Because you're all learning this stuff for free that your doctors will not even explain to you. All right, four markers of inflammation. MPO is a marker of blockage Forming or breaking. Blockage where? In the passages, the plaque forming or breaking. That's a measurement. And it releases this inflammation marker called MPO. Right? LPPLA activity, a marker of blockage forming, cracking or shifting. Dangerous. Right? Dangerous. It means that there's been an earthquake and the plaque is moving, which is very dangerous, right? You're gonna, if it blocks the wrong patch, you're gone. <laughs> yeah, that was a heart attack. Yeah. You're shaking like a rabbit. Oh, HSCRP are real, this is more reactive. A, a reactive protein, it is a protein that the body releases to tell the army of stem cells and cytos, cytokines and growth factors that we have an inflammation come and do repair. So when it's very high, it's not good. Then fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is an early indication of inflammation. Inflammation, we all have it. If your GI is not clean and you don't poo twice a day, good number four poo, you have inflammation. Bad. That's the primary source of inflammation, your GI. So th just think that, oh, I'm fine. We are all inflamed because you eat crappy food. You eat food from restaurants. You eat food that is not well washed. You eat food that is not cooked very well. You drink water that's not filtered. You breathe air that's not filtered. All of that causes inflammation, unfortunately. 
welcome to the world, right? Let me show you that picture again of the blood, of the sugar racing inside your blood and causing damage, right? Isn't it amazing? That sugar that you love so much, as I cover my eyes, I can just taste that chocolate <laughs> or that ice cream. As you go to the refrigerator, you look at that ice cream. You should have just one spoon of ice cream a week. That's it. Not one cup. One spoon. <laughs> one spoon a week, not a day. <laughs> That's too much. Because look at it. It says sugar crystals are like small bits of glass. Too much sugar in your blood is like having broken glass. <laughs> Tearing at and damaging your artery walls. Can you feel that? Do you feel that, Karen? Yeah. So whenever you look at sugar, look at you are the enemy. <laughs> this increases the likelihood of cholesterol getting trapped and forming a blockage. Right? Okay, now let's go and look at metabolics. And now that we've talked about sugar, what do you think metabolics is going to be about? It's about sugar. Because we love sugar. Even God knew we were going to have this problem. So he put all these metrics in place. You can have sugar, but not too much. Only when you're young. Once you're more than 30, you should stop eating sugar. <laughs> but I know most of you didn't see that warning sign. You're 30 years old, no more sugar. Karen is already past sugar eating. Luke is getting close. The sign is going to be up. Luke, no more sugar. <laughs> Pauline has about three more years. Most of the other people in the room, Neda may have some a few months, but everybody else in the room is past the age for sugar eating. All right. Let's look at the big problems of sugar. Number one, pre-diabetes. You know, I asked Dr. Yi to watch something the other day. A hundred million Americans have diabetes or pre-diabetes. That's one third. By 2025, it will be 50% have pre or have diabetic. And that's what's happening in their bloodstream. Too much sugar. So what this th thing does, it gives you a measurement of whether you're developing diabetes. And for me, the shock was the first time I measured it, it was green, 5.6, but no, that's not good enough. Because at my age, if it is 5.6, there's a tendency by the time I'm 70, it's going to be around 6. So immediately, I instituted lifestyle changes because it should be around 5.2. And some people measure it as six. Oh, but my doctor said it was fine. No, you're already diabetic. And once you're diabetic, it takes three years on the ketogenic diet to reverse it. And reversal does not mean cure. It means removing some of the microvascular damages that diabetes rots on you. What is the biggest damage from diabetes? We're going to talk about it. Number one is the damage to your pancreas, what we call the isolates of Langerhans where insulin is made. By the time you're diabetic, 50% of the organ is already destroyed. So there is nothing like, except you come and we give you some stem cells to repair that. If not, you're fucked. Sorry for that. Uh, then the second measurement it measures is what we call HbA1c, which is the powerful indicator for diabetes. That's what I was talking about. You see, mine was 5.6. That's a lie. It's green. It depends on your age. If it's green, you want to start taking care so that it doesn't go that way, but it goes this way, right? We don't want it moving into yellow at all. We want it staying deep into the green. Very important. That's when you cut off all sugar and you minimize carbohydrates immediately, including fruits. You know, people are telling me, oh, but I love fruits. No, if your menopausal fruits are too sweet for you. The only fruits are blueberries, blackberries, and avocado. That's it. 
any other fruit is too sweet, too much sugar. If not, it will cause that damage. So let no your doctor don't lie to you that you can have fruits. No, you cannot if you're menopausal. Insulin resistance, it's the a body's ability to process sugar. Most people who are menopausal have insulin resistance already. So we have to measure that. Then we measure actual amount of glucose in your blood, right? We have a prick test here. And that amount of sugar in your blood should be either 70 or 90. It should be between here. And if you actually stop eating sugar totally and carbohydrates reduce, you can actually then get something like that, which is much better because it actually causes less stress on the overall metabolic architecture. So that's why ketogenic diets are on the rise because they actually provide you a lot of safety from stress and also keep your sugar level okay. Why would your sugar level be at that level if you don't eat carbohydrates? Because you're also getting sugar from proteins and fat. The body can build energy from that. So you don't actually need that, right? Then there are other ones like insulin, which is the hormone that contains. So all of these measurements measure your metabolic results, right? And so overall then, overall, we then arrive at some genetic test results. Um, a couple of that, I'm not going to go deep into that because it begins to really look at some very deep issues. Um, it begins to match, for example, uh, the statin-induced myopathy gene. It's a gene linked to muscle aches and pains due to statins, which is the reason why most people will not take their medication. They, they have high blood pressure, high cholesterol. The doctor prescribes statins to them. They don't take it because it causes muscle ache. And that's a genetic susceptibility that we measure to find out how you're going to be able to respond to statins. Or we have a gene that responds better to medication or lifestyle. There are some people who are optimized to that, right? The minute they start losing weight, they lose it quickly. Then there are some people like me. It doesn't matter how much food I reduce, my body doesn't want to reduce weight because I'm so good looking that if this architecture changed, I might become really ugly. So the architecture of God says, no, we want to keep you good looking. <laughs> And then the third one is the blood clot protein genes, which are very important. And if you don't have the right ones, it increases clot formation. So some people are genetically uh, susceptible to clots forming. And so we want to know whether you have those genes. That's what these results do. And it produces um, a lot of different things. And then there are some other tests that um, we also measure as part of, um, oops, sorry, it's running away from me, as part of your health. So we also do a liver test. You know, I was talking about those big organs that we want to test. When we look at cardiometabolics, it's very important that we test the liver. And we'll look at the, the to evaluate liver function to see how much of this, um, uh, liver enzymes are in the bloodstream. It tells us the performance of your liver. We also want to look at kidney. A very big thing for black people uh, because we eat, there's even a special measurement for black people, right? So there's one for non-African American and there's one for African American. This is one of those special times when black people have a special thing, right? Most of that times is bullshit. So there's burn and creatinine, which are all the good measures to show uh, kidney performance. And then we also want to look at muscle performance. So we look at all of these things in the muscle. And then it also does some thyroid testing to look at vitamin D, which is really very critical. We spoke about vitamin D. Uh, cholesterol is used for making vitamin D. Then we look at homocysteine and albumin which are proteins that are critical for. So these are other tests that come in. And then 
this report then tells you what are the good facts and what are the bad facts. So let's look at some of the bad facts. The good facts are unsaturated fats like almonds, unsalted nuts, but I'm going to caution you about nuts, dried nuts. A lot of dried nuts in America have mold. So you have to be careful when you buy nuts. And what is the best way of taking the molds out of the dried nuts? You heat the nuts so you can kill the mold. So if you just buy raw nuts and you eat the nuts or even fried nuts and you eat them or air dried, yeah, because you bought them from Trader Joe's. <laughs> they didn't say that if you get sick from them, they'll pay you a million bucks. So you need to take care of your health and not be stupid. So nuts, the process of taking them from fresh to dry, most times molds escape into it. So you need to be careful when you eat nuts. So we look at natural but nut butter, avocado. You're careful with avocado. If the avocado is already having black spots, it's already having mold. So since I read all this stuff, I stopped eating guacamole. Since I'm not sure what's in the guacamole, what kind of avocado was used. Let's look at omega-3 fatty acids, which is EPA, DHA. But you know we have that here. Uh, do we have the flaxseed one too? Um, so if you look at this one, this one is fish oil. We also have the flaxseed one. Gives you good omega-3 fatty acids, which comes from, I told you, very special fishes, salmon, sardines, herring, tuna, mackerel, fish oil, and capsules. capsules. Where's the flaxseed one? And then we have the alpha linolenic acid, which comes, which is the omega-3 from plants. We have walnuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, and some of the plant-based oils like flax seeds. What are the bad fats? Dairy. Full fat dairy, butter. Some butters are good. It has to be really good program butter. Cheese. I eat some cheese for the fermented part. Dessert. Karen, you hear that? No dessert. Fatty meats. Always cut that fat off the meat. Dr. E loves that especially. So don't just go into that bacon and say, oh, this I can have fat. Yeah. Oh, trans fatty acid, shortening, frosting, stick margarine, fried foods, packaged sweets are all bullshit, right? So you also want to do what we call the Boston Heart Fatty Acid Balance Test. And it tells us that fats are not all bad. The right balance and types of fats in your diet are important for your health, right? So you want to have saturated, trans fat, Monosaturated is bad. The unsat sat, it's important. Your omega-3 index, your EPA, DHA, and ALA. All these measurements are very important. It's extensive. And you know what most patients will say? Oh my God, it's too much to know. And what I say is if you don't wanna know, then just die. What is the point being ignorant? because you become a liability to all of us. It's painful to be sick. Being sick is not fun. So prevention solves that problem. Being sick and having pain is not fun. I have friends who have had heart attacks. Having a stroke and surviving after a stroke is not fun. So it's better to pay the price up front than later on to become an angry citizen who's pissed off all the time because you made a mistake, because you were ignorant. So it's very important, guys, as we talk about this, that you begin to understand why I take all these supplements. So Dr. Yi is now taking um, PolyMVA, which is very good for uh, clearing her kidney and her liver. Buluke, one of one of the best supplements that we have is for people who have circulatory issues. 
So if you have microcirculatory issues, how do you know you have microcirculation? You have tingling, pain, and numbness in your feet and your fingers. And typically, as women grow older, they have more, they're, they're cold in their feet. When you're very cold in your feet and hands, it means you're not getting enough circulation. So you want to improve that circulation. So plaque X is a very important treatment we have for both oral and IV that clears the plaque and reduces your incidence of uh, uh, cholesterol accumulation. That's the poly-MVA. That's the IV that Dr. Yi is taking. It's what we call a complex lipoic acid. It's very good for treating the liver and the kidneys. Um, there are a couple of things. Berberin, I take that just for management of sugar. Because even though I say don't eat carbohydrates, once in a while I eat rice. I'm a bad boy. <laughs> I love rice. So I eat a couple of spoons. It's OK. You can't kill yourself. What is the fun living if you can enjoy a few spoons of rice? <laughs> right? And so this helps me manage my optimal glucose metabolism. Helps me remove that sugar from the blood. And that's very important. Right? Then where's nicine? Nicine is one of the only products with uh, Citronox that will remove, that will optimize your HDL function. So we have Cardiolox HDL, one of the supplements that would optimize your HDL function, that ensuring that the HDL particles carry the cholesterol to the liver and make sure that the transportation and excretion, what we call reverse, the reverse HDL function. Citronox helps with providing nitric oxide. My friend, nitric oxide, what does it do? Vasodilation. It opens up the arteries so that blood flow is normalized and optimal. Niacin, just beautiful, helps with the overall cholesterol metabolism and transport. So these are very, very important products. We have some other things here. Um, then we have bergamot, and that's normally we use that for blood pressure management. Very important. So if you, as I'm, I'm, I want to summarize, so if you think about cardiometabolic health, let's just walk through the four big things. Number one was lipids, what we call li lipidology, the management of fat in your body. Therefore, the interventions around that, I've spoken about that, is how you then manage that balance and the production and the excretion of good fats. So you want to make sure you're eating only good fats and you optimize your HDL, LDL function. That was number one. Number two was inflammation. The big source of inflammation that wounds your arteries is sugar. That's it. Sugar. Um, I asked a patient the other day, would you, um, you love sugar more than you love your legs? Because you know you get amputated or you lost your vision because you love sugar. That's what diabetes in the end stages. You know, most people who have diabetes don't understand what happens towards the end stages of diabetes. There's glaucoma, there's kidney failure, there's dialysis, there's amputation. It's horrible. Just because you love sugar, it's not worth the price. So that inflammation drivers are very, very important. Number three, we spoke about glucose metabolism, right? It is a very important part for energy, but energy can also come from protein and fats. Actually, the body is much optimized in using fats for energy, and that's the process called ketogenesis. And ketogenic diets are actually driving mitochondria to use fat for energy production rather than glucose. And finally, you need to know about your genetic architecture, your susceptibilities. Am I genetically optimized 
or genetically sub-optimized. And knowing all of that, it's very important for us to move to the next step where we then evaluate how we're going to work with you. I hope you have enjoyed this journey into your heart, your bloodstream, your liver, your kidney with me. You enjoy the trucks, the little trucks, the little boys, the big trucks, and the truck sizes, and the truck performance. Have a good evening, good night. Thank you very much. Question.